to see really, I guess. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, should we set off then? Okay. I can't hear you, but uh, hopefully you can hear me and everybody can. We hear can. Me. We're okay. on mute. You're not. Go for it. But, <laughs> all right. Well, I just feel like I'm speaking into the void, which I guess is okay. I, it won't be the first time I've spoken into the void. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about planning process and production. And I thought rather than just show you some slides of my work and just talk about the examples that I'm showing you, I thought I'd try and put some structure around it. And so I've picked out about six pieces of my work and I thought I'd talk about the planning and the process of developing an idea and how that idea moves from an idea that's gone off in my head into final production of the work. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I thought what I'd do first is show you this piece, which is called Zen Girls, and it's carved out of a single piece of Carrara marble. And it, it's um, often a lot of my work starts through direct carving. And um, I often talk about Zen because I often get ideas when I'm not actually thinking of anything. And if I can't think of anything, I often just go in the studio, I get a piece of marble or a piece of stone, and I just start carving away at it. And suddenly my thoughts start getting unlocked by the simple act of just direct carving, just rhythmically hitting a lump of stone with a with a mallet and a and a and a um, and a chisel. And then I sort of start to start, the thinking process starts kicking out. So the idea behind this started um, a while ago when I made another piece called Zen Men. And that's two fat naked blokes sat on a bench and they're sort of side by side, but facing in opposite directions. And the bench is really thin. And I don't know whether you can notice off this slide or not, but the um, the bench doesn't have any legs. And the joke behind the work is that, you know, there's two big people sat on the bench and they're holding it up. And how can they do that? It's sort of magic, really. Uh, only sculpture can, um, can do the impossible. So that was the starting point for this work, but I called it Zen Girls and it's two figures pressing back to back so, and they're sort of they've got their hands under the bench to sort of hold it up so it almost feels like you could hold this seat up and sit on it at the same time so it's about working together connectedness about being self-supporting and um so so this is the finished piece pretty much so how did i get to the finished piece well if we go to the next slide what I do, and I'm sure lots of you do too, is I, I work out some preparatory drawings. So I'm thinking about how do I want these figures to sit on the seat? And I figured I wanted it to be a square seat because for the Zen men, it was a very long, thin bench and they were sat side to side. So you could see the fronts and the backs. And But this is slightly different. I thought instead of a long, other long seat, I, I do the square seat. And I wanted the figures to sit on the corners. I wanted it to be a bit more tension in it. So the sort of, instead of sat on the long edges, they sat on the corners of the seat. So I did some drawings, think how it might look. And uh, I thought, yeah, okay, I'll probably do something with that. And if we go to the next slide, I thought, well, one, one of the things that might happen when I start to build it as a three-dimensional object is will it fall over if i put these two figures on this base it might well tip to the side it might not be self-supporting so okay the quick way to test that is to make a very quick maquette so this is quite small and uh it, it's freestanding i actually got it here Because I can't see me, I don't know whether you can see this or not, so I can't see what I'm showing you on the screen. Anyway, you turned you your, have you turned your camera off, Tony? Uh, I don't yeah. think so. Hmm. Okay. Is my camera on now or not? I, 
I can't tell because I'm sharing screen, but Carla, can you tell? Oh, there you go. Yeah, I can see me now. I don't know whether you can see what I'm holding up or not. Yeah, that's better. But this is the actual maquette on the slide that I'm showing you. So this is the real thing. So it's dead tiny. And the figures are just made out of, um, it's a sort of clay that you can get and you just bake it in the oven. And the orange bit underneath is literally just a piece of foam. I don't even know what this, this stuff's called, but I made it, it took about 10 minutes to make it. And I just wanted to make sure that it would stand up without falling over. Because what I didn't want to do is get a massive big piece of marble and then start to carve it for months and months and months. And then when I got a bit nearer to the final piece that it would tip over and the idea would be uh, useless. So if we just click on the next slide, we don't really need this slide now because I've actually shown you the real thing. A bit stupid of me, I forgot the slide was there, yeah. So the next slide is the actual piece of marble that I started to carve because I now felt confident that I could actually buy this sort of massive lump of marble and start to carve it and it wouldn't fall over and I wouldn't be end up with a, a bill for a piece of sculpture that was rubbish really. So um, the figure on the left, the, the image on my left is the big piece of stone that I carved it out of. And the image on the right hand side is how it looks as I'm beginning to carve it. So we can whisk to the next slide now. Again, I'm talking about process and production here. So one of the things that you do when you carve in big pieces of stone is I know in the end, I'm going to have to carve all the space out underneath this, but, but that becomes the last thing you do because you don't want it to break. So, so you basically work in the top piece of the marble and carve in the form out of it. And you can see in the right hand side, I'm starting to get the corners of the seat. So they're getting quite well resolved. And the figures, the heads, the arms, the chest, the legs are getting quite resolved. But I'm not carving anything out from underneath because I don't want to, to weaken the marble. And that's the last thing I do. Okay, if we nip to the next slide. So again, here you can see a little bit more resolve and I'm starting to tip the stone up in the right hand picture so that I can start to cut away underneath. And you can just see the sort of the chops into the, into the stone between the legs where I'm, I'm sort of chopping it out. Okay, next slide, please. And here you can see in more detail, I've now got the piece tipped upside down and I'm starting to cut away. And in the right hand picture, you can see um, quite a lot of it's gone now and it's wet because I'm starting to polish it down with, uh, with wet and dry sandpaper and basically grinding away all the, all, all the stone to get a smooth surface. Okay, and this is in Italy where I uh, do most of my carving. Okay, this next slide that you're seeing now is I've brought the sculpture back to my studio up here in England in Southport and I finished the carving and the polishing and you'll notice in the left hand slide, I've now got it elevated up on some blocks of wood. And the reason that I'm doing that is I'm now thinking about how I can move this piece of marble, which is a one off carving, it, 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 it's an individual piece. And I'm thinking that maybe what I can do now is turn it into a bronze. Uh, casting because then I can make multiples of it and um, and that's what I proceeded to do. So in the in the left hand picture you can see uh, a technician, um, a guy called Neil and what he's doing and why it's elevated up onto blocks is that he's putting red crosses all over the sculpture and um, and that's what he and he's then going to photograph it and that will get programmed into a computer to make a 3D render. So if we look at the next slide, please. So here's Neil with his camera and all these red crosses on the sculpture. And so he works all the way around. It takes him quite a long time. 
taking hundreds of photographs, which then all get put together. Don't ask me how it happens, I'm not sure. But he puts them all in the computer and makes a 3D render um, that we then can make a mold from to cast it into bronze. So if we look at the next slide, uh, this is what the finished bronze looks like. So I'm now going to talk about the process of how we move from the original bronze carving to make this, uh, sorry, the original marble carving to uh, end up with this cast piece of bronze. So if we go to the next slide, I just put this in to give you a sense of scale so you can see that the bronze piece is about half scale of the marble piece. And again, you can see, you can see the, the, um, the, the crosses and the lines very, very closely on the, on the marble. So how do we get to the finished piece of bronze? I don't know whether anybody knows about bronze casting or not, but I'm just gonna take you briefly through the process. So if we look at the next slide, might be difficult to work these images out, so I'll just talk you through them. In the first slide, you can see, if you can make it out, you can see two objects on the top of this barrel. Um, one object is the, is the Zen girl's casting, which is covered now in a ceramic mold. And the piece to the left hand side is a, actually a ceramic dish, which they were casting at the same time. So the, the ceramic dish is very dish shaped, you can see it on the left. And my piece is on the right hand side, you can see it covered in the ceramic mold. In the middle image, you can see the two uh, um, bronze foundry workers pouring the molten bronze into the cast. And the, the thing behind them, which is like a, bi a big dustbin with the top lid off, is this incredibly hot kiln where all the, the, the actual hard, cold bronze gets. Uh, I think it goes up to something at 11,000 degrees so that it actually melts. So they're pouring it in and the, the actual casts are set in, a, in this big um, barrel of sand. And the sand's there to keep it steady, okay? And in the, in the far picture, in the sort of pink stuff is the bronze as it's going cool. So you can see, you can see it cooling off. And, and the sort of the square chalice sort of thing is the, um, is the funnel essentially that they pour the bronze down and the, and the sort of legs the bronze runs down there into the cast and that will become a bit more apparent when we look at the, the next slide. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So in the first picture on the left, you can see the, the Zen girls upside down and, and you can see the cast being cracked. And you can also in the background see the bronze dish that they cast at the same time with, and that's had all the ceramic knocked off it. In the middle picture, you can see them running a uh, hosepipe of cold water over the bronze to cool it down that bit quicker. And in the far picture, you can see them hammering uh, the, the ceramic cast from, from the bronze. Okay, if we go to the next picture, again, you see most of the ceramic smashed off it now. And it stood upright on the, so it's sort of the right way up in the middle picture, and not quite got all the ceramic off it. And then on the, in the far picture, you can see um, one of the technicians with a, with a steel cutter, and he is cutting off at the feet of the Zen girls. He's cutting off the runners, and that will go back in the waste to be re, um, remelted down. Okay, so, so the next slide shows just the next part of the process. And this is the sandblasting and patination. And this is Andy. So in the first picture, the Zen girl's cast has been in the sandblasting machine. And uh, it, it's clean. That's basically used to clean up the metal. 
And then in the next slide, you can see Andy with a paintbrush and he has a blowtorch. And if we go to the next slide, what he does then is he paints the patina, which is a chemical compound. And I've chosen this greeny, uh, um, bluey green patina for this particular piece of bronze. So he paints it on and at the same time, he, he floats a blowtorch across the metal and the heat from the blowtorch fixes the patina onto the final piece. So if we go to the next slide, we can see the final piece on a plinth. And um, so, so that's, that's what the finished piece looks like after it's been through that process. Okay. I don't know whether you take qu questions at the end, but we, we move on to the next piece now. Okay, so this next piece of work that I'm going to show you is called Sweet Meeting. And a lot of my practice, if you've ever looked at my website or know my work, I often play with words and that becomes a big part of my practice. And the, the maquette for this piece of work was a polo mints. And I'm sure everybody knows what polo mints look like, um, perhaps even taste like. And the, of course, as well as polo mints, there are these polo fruits. So this started out as my maquette for the work and it's called Sweet Meeting. And if we go to the next slide, please. Again, this is the, fin this is the first piece. And I, uh, again, this is carved from Carrara marble. I guess it's about 24 inches across. So it's, um, it's quite big, um, but you'll notice that it, even though it looks like a polo, it doesn't actually say polo, it says loop. And again, that's part of my playing with words. And it's a bit like the Zen girls that I showed you originally. You don't immediately notice that the seat, that the bench doesn't have legs. And he, here, you immediately think it says polo, even though it says loop. And that's what most people think it says. And that what you see isn't always what you get is very much part of my practice. So again, the process starts with direct carving. But all the time I'm thinking about how can I alter or extend my thinking from, from this piece of work so it becomes more than a, a one-off piece. So if we look at the next slide, you can see that this is, um, this is where I move from a polo mint to a, to a fruit polo. And what I've done is I've had a series of fiberglass moulds made from the original marble piece and I'm these are back in the studio now and I'm painting them with sign writers enamels so I can get some nice sweety tasty looking colours going on onto these so I've made these into a suite of five um, again pun on the word sweet so there's a suite of five different loops made uh, made in the five different colours and whilst I was making them, I thought, well, maybe I can extend it again. And it's always about experimentation. So if we show the next slide. So I thought, well, maybe I can do some screen prints as well. So I did a residency over at the art house in Wakefield, which is a brilliant uh, gallery in uh, a set of studios over in, uh, in Wakefield in Yorkshire. And uh, I thought I'd use them. Um, a fragment of the image. So if we can go to the next slide. So I just took a photograph of part of the loop and solarized the image. And here you can see them being screen printed. This one's in orange and red. So I used two colors. If we go to the next slide, please. And these are three of them. So you can see them in the colors, uh, orange and red, like green and purple, yellow and purple. And uh, so the backgrounds are one color and the fronts are a different color. And again, these are a series of five. And I quite like to see them as a series of five in a long line against the wall. If we look at the next slide, you can sort of see the two. The, I was just setting these up for the exhibition. 
So the green and orange in the screen prints, and you can see the green and the orange fiberglass loops as well. If we go to the next slide, you can actually see them in the exhibition. Okay, if we go to the next slide. And the final bit of this process was to actually stack them together like a whole bunch of sweets. So I just call these vertical loops and horizontal loops. So the process started out with a polo mint and the sort of recollections of a sweet meeting. Uh, the mint became the maquette and then the scale changed and the word polo became an anagram of the loop. And then it became the fiberglass moulds painted in different colours. And then it became screen prints of a fragment of the image and then into multiples. So what I'm trying to show you here is how I extend and push an idea and that becomes part of the process. And of course, some of them will be more successful than others. But I think experiment experimentation is part of the creative process and I'm sure you all you know, you all do this, you know, or experiment as part of your process. When I started to carve this in Italy, one of the guys kept walking by and he looked at my polo mint and he was saying, what's this? And I said, oh, it's my maquette. And he'd pick it up and put it in his mouth and say, mm, no maquette. And uh, I would get my packet of polos out and then put another one there. So it became a bit of a standing joke, really. I kept eating my maquette. Okay, next slide, please. I thought I'd just explain this, because again, it was, uh, it was just an idea I had. And I call this series of images, uh, Cycle Tour of Europe, and I've bracketed it, uh, subtitle, Freedom of Movement. And it really came to a head because of Brexit and the fact that we would lose our freedom of movement across Europe if we chose to leave the EEC, which is exactly what's happened now. But I'd already started to take photographs of bikes that I'd seen, and they're really curious, and I'm sure you'll have seen them too. They're bikes that have been sort of locked up with a padlock against a lamppost or a, a piece of street furniture um, for security, so the bike doesn't get nicked. But instead of the bike getting nicked, people then start nicking various bits of the bike. So you'll see bikes with the wheels missing or the seats missing and the handlebars missing. And usually they've ended up getting rusty and, and kind of knackered because the people have just abandoned them, really. And I started to see them in England, but when I, I, I do a lot of travelling across Europe, well, I used to do before covid and, uh, I, and I was noticing all over Europe, these bikes in various states of um, dismantlement. So I just thought about the idea of these bikes being took apart and then somewhere, maybe in a shed somewhere, all these strange bits of bikes get put, put together and become a new bike. And then the person who's nicked all the bits cycles off and chains it somewhere while they go go off somewhere and then when they come back bits get missing so there's this constant recycling of bikes going on and again uh, playing with the pun of cycling and recycling so if we go to the next slide so just I guess the piece for me became a metaphor for freedom of movement and uh, this first bike I think was in Sweden on the left hand side and uh, chained to a, to a fence with its front wheel missing and its seat missing and bits of it sort of rusty. And then on, on the other picture, this was um, a bike chained to a, a, some street furniture in London, which is where I used to live when I took this photograph. If we go to the next slide, the bike on the left which is upside down with various bits of it missing and quite rusty, is in uh, Copenhagen. And I think the bottom, the picture on the right hand side, I think might have been in Glasgow, though I can't remember. And there's two, there's two bikes in that picture, so two for the price of one, really. And in the next photograph, 
what I've started to do now is combine these photographs into journeys. So the first photograph on the left is where I actually live now in Southport. And you can't just quite see my building where I live, but it's in the background. It's just to the left of the bridge. And um, in front of where I live is this massive boating lake, which you can see. And they'd been dredging all sorts of stuff out of the boating lake. And they dredged up these two bikes. I don't know whether you can see them clearly enough in your pictures, but they're covered in sort of barnacles and, uh, and sort of, um, uh, they've obviously been in the lake for quite a long time. And in the picture on the right hand side is a workshop where I work in Carrara in Northwest Italy. And again, there's this abandoned bike that's absolutely covered in white marble dust and surrounded by bits of old marble. And I thought, well, this is my journey. I go from Southport where I live to Carrara to carve marble. And so maybe that's what I'll do in the work. I'll connect the photographs into journeys. So this next slide, please, is um, if you can go on the next slide. Hello. Oh, there we go. I didn't know whether you could hear me or not. Uh, just the slide before that, please. Now, if you can go the other way, sorry, go back, you're going the wrong way. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, and if you can lose the words, Can you lose the, um, the notes? Thanks. Okay, so in the top bit, these are just the places where I took the photographs. As you can see, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Bergen, Brighton, Bruges, Cambridge, Carrara, Cologne, Copenhagen, Desenzano, Florence, Geneva, Liverpool, London, Lucca, Glasgow, Madrid, Manchester, Monaco, Munich, Nice, Paris, Pisa, Southport, Strasse, Turin, Oslo, Oxford. Valencia and Zurich. So they're the all the places where, where I ended up taking the photographs. Okay, if we can go to the next photograph, please. The, the next slide, rather. So this is what I did. These are screen prints. So what I did is I, I made a composite of most of those photographs. And underneath where it says cycle to review, I just put all those cities in all those countries of where the photographs are taken. And that, that is printed at A1 as a screen print. Again, it's an edition of five. So A1 is the bigger size. And then if we go to the next slide, please. These are the connections. So the first, uh, um, this is again, is a screen print made at A2. And the left-hand picture is an abandoned bike at Carrara railway station. So I always travel to Carrara, well, pretty often on the train. I sometimes I drive, but mostly I go on the train. And then in the next um, image next to it is the image of London, which is where I'd set off from. So my cycle to review Europe is two wrecked bikes in the city that I start off from and the city I end up with. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is the uh, um, Southport and then to Colonata, which again is somewhere I carve in Italy. So my journey from where I live now, Southport to Colonata. Okay, next slide. And this is, uh, this just shows the screen print frame. And the next slide, the next slide shows the, the, the suite of images. So there's the big A1, in the middle, and then there's the four uh, journeys printed in A2 at each side of it, so you can get a sense of what they look like all together just on the gallery wall. Okay, if we move on to the next slide and the next piece I just want to talk about, uh, this is the penultimate piece I'm going to show you. 
And this is called Damage, the Five Giants. Uh, it's a piece of Portland stone that I've carved five words into. I'm, I'm not sure if you can work out the words, but it says want, disease, squalor, idleness, and ignorance. And they are the five giants, the five pillars of the welfare state. And I don't know whether you remember, but earlier last year, it was the 75th anniversary of the birth of the welfare, welfare state and uh, the introduction of the beverage report. And basically what Beveridge said to Clement Attlee, the prime minister of the time is, if we want to introduce a welfare state, we need to rid ourselves of these five giants, these five pillars. So we need to eradicate want, disease, squalor, idleness and ignorance. And it just occurred to me that here we are, you know, 75 years later, and we still have all those five things we're, we're the fifth richest nation in the world, apparently, but we haven't been able to eradicate them. And I got this piece of stone lying about in the yard of the studio, which you can kind of see just beyond the edge of the uh, image where I keep lumps of stone. And it was a broken piece of stone. So you've got to imagine that I didn't carve this and then smash the ends off. I had a blank piece of stone. So you've got to imagine a blank piece of stone that's already smashed. And I decided to carve the words in it. So it's kind of a, a work in reverse. Instead of the work getting damaged, it's the work is imposed on top of a broken piece of stone. Okay, let's go up the next slide. So you kind of see the process, which is in reverse, really. So I've actually lettered the broken piece of stone. I don't know whether I'm making sense or not, but hopefully you, you, you get it. Okay, moving on. So the final slides, please. This is the final piece that I want to show you and it's called um, Monument to the Unintended Performer. And again, I just thought I'd show you the finished piece before I take you through the process. So this is a large work, it's about 55 feet tall. And it was, um, I made it for the Olympics and Paralympics in 2012. And uh, it was commissioned by Channel 4 Television. And the big building in the background you see is Channel 4's uh, TV center. Okay, so how did I get to the process? Well, if we go to the next slide, you can see the start of my, um, my thinking. So this is the maquette of the big four from the TV that you'll see if you watch Channel 4 TV. And what they do is they spin this image around often. And when you look at it from the front, it becomes very clearly a four. But if you look at it from the sides, it looks like it does in the first and middle pictures. So it's all these strange verticals and horizontals set um, a little distance from each other. So it's quite square in its format. In the middle picture, you see a drawing of what the actual thing looks like. And the random image on the right hand side, you may have recognized as being uh, a piece of work called Discobolus by the Greek sculptor Myron. And this was carved, this is uh, from antiquity, and it's often called a discus thrower. So it's one of those classical marble sculptures. And of course, I started my thinking process for this. Uh, well, where did the Olympic Games start? Well, it started in Greece. So it seemed um, the right starting point for, um, for a, a piece of work for the Olympics and Paralympics. And what I did is added to it the ubiquitous disability logo, you know, the stick figure in the wheelchair that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a computer render um, of my idea. So what I've done basically is put together the, the image of Discobolus, the marble figure, and I've took the head, the, the arm with the discus, a little bit of the torso and the other arm, 
I've superimposed that on the channel for the big four and I've encompassed the wheelchair logo by adding this big circle of neon. There's three massive neon tubes which replicate the wheel of the wheelchair. And I've introduced gold, silver and bronze into the verticals and uprights, which you can just about see on the, on the CAD image in the left hand picture. And in the right hand picture, you can see what, ha what the technician has done is put an image of the Channel 4 building and then superimposed the sculpture on top of it. So it actually looks like it's in front of the building. And that's the, the image that I, um, or the series of images that I put into Channel 4 for the competition. So this is all computer aided design, it's all computer uh, developed. Okay, if we go to the next slide. And this is the working construction. On the left, you can see the big four outside of channel four, and it's first painted in red oxide to protect it against rust. But I didn't want it in red oxide. I wanted it in gray, so you could hardly see the structure of the four. So um, if you can just see it in the, in the right hand picture, that's my black van. Uh, uh, parked illegally outside Channel 4 where they've got it covered over and there's the big yellow um, cherry picker to start making the construction. And you might just be able to see we've just put the gold and the silver blocks onto the, onto the big grey four. I wanted the structure of the actual four to just blend into the background of the building. So if we go to the next slide, please. Again, just close-ups. So you can see the construction started, the big crane is, um, the crane is lifting up the head in this particular piece. And you can see the cherry picker with the, the guy in the hard hat. He's starting to swing the head into position and the arms uh, uh, to fix it in place. If we go to the next slide, you can see it a little bit closer and you can see the guy on top of the big four and he's just, sort of positioning as the crane lowers the head down so that we can get it fixed onto the channel four. There were 18 people working on this piece to try and get it finished before the actual launch of the Olympic Games. It was a bit of, um, it was a, bit of a, a nightmare really. Okay, if we go to the next slide. And this is the final piece. So you can see it outside the, the building in the left hand, you can see the steps leading up to the building. And in the right hand picture, you can just see, um, I think it's a taxi going past with its lights on uh, in freeze frame. And that's the final picture. So hopefully I've given you a sense there of the various stages and the processes that my work goes through from sort of start to finish, from idea to final piece. So that's planning, process and production, and a little bit of a glimpse into some of the works as I have taken through that series of, um, of, of, of stages. Okay, I, I'm done talking at you now. I don't know whether you're still there. You've probably all wandered off and gone for a nod. Not me, Tony, I was very on the ball. Or a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, you had to stay on the ball. Because you, you had to move the slides around, so everybody else, Everybody else could just disappear. <laughs> but, um...